my name's Ellen and I'm part of the team here at Grace Life. Here's what's coming up in the life of our church. Join us for prayer and worship at our encounter night tomorrow night, 6pm at our Malaga Hub. Take some bread from our bread tables available at both locations and share with people in need. Details for the bread tables are on your screens. Next week is the last week to RSVP for our women's event in Mandra. If you have any more questions, then please feel free to contact Pastor Ali. Hey man, don't forget that we have a special breakfast coming up in August and we have a special guest, Graham, who is coming. And um, Graham is well known in his work in the community, being a 33 year veteran of the 6PR um, radio show and also establishing Lifeline WA for counselling in the community. So you don't want to miss this. Make sure you invite somebody and RSVP at the information desk. Air and Youth, really excited. We're coming back this Friday in Ellenbrook, 6.30 to 9 p.m. exploring the story of Joseph. This term, it's called Emerging Our Theme. And so if you'd like the bus, make sure to RSVP each week. Our schedule is gonna be on our social media, so don't forget to tune into that. Hey, Grace Life. Wanna let you know about an exciting initiative coming up on Sunday, August 22. We're gonna have an incredible celebration weekend for our annual faith offering. You know, God has done some amazing things in and through the Grace Life family over the years, and by faith, He's gonna keep doing great things. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And I wanna encourage you, church, just now over the coming weeks, why not ask God by faith, Lord, how would you have me contribute to an offering that says thank you for who you are and would you bless continually the many people near and far. There'll be more information coming to you over the coming weeks. I wanna ask you church, just be open to Holy Spirit, moving you in the realm of faith and gratitude in the lead up to the 22nd. Hey, I want to encourage you to come along and partner with us if you have been at Grace Life for a number of months or you're fairly new and you're wanting to get involved. One of the best ways to grow in discipleship is through serving. So I want to encourage you to come along and join one of our teams, whether it's a Sunday team or a team throughout the week. There are these cards that you can fill out if you would like to be contacted about it or speak to somebody already serving in one of these teams. Join us as we continue to contribute to the Grace Life family through the joy of giving. If you would like to join us with giving, there are many ways that you can do this and that is through text to give, FPOS and the giving boxes at the back of the church. Thank you for your generosity. Stick around after the service for a coffee and a chat. Get to know someone new and we hope that you have a wonderful week. We are about to hear a message from one of our speakers. I want to encourage you to be anticipating that God wants to speak to you through our message today. So get ready to engage with the message and hear what God has to say to you. All right, Hebrews chapter 11 this morning, we're beginning a new series on, uh, the, on Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, in the lead up to this, I was uh, uh, listening to Christian radio um, the other day. Uh, I think it was last week sometime. And uh, I heard the pastor speaking on Christian radio and he was recounting the testimony of a man in his congregation who some years ago walked into his, ch uh, into his uh, office, into the pastor's office and said to him, I'm feeling really dry and uh, uh, I feel like the Bible is just lifeless to me. There's nothing really happening when I read my Bible. I'm, I don't really feel like I've got a love for the Word of God anymore. He said, will you pray for me? So the pastor said, sure. And he gave him some counsel, prayed for him. 
And um, the pastor said he really didn't feel like anything moved or changed initially. The uh, gentleman went back into the congregation. And he would see him at different times. He didn't notice anything largely transpiring in the man's life. But over the period of time, things did change. And what happened was 10 years after that event, 10 years after that event, the man walked up to the pastor and he said, do you remember when you prayed for me in your office about the Word of God and the Bible and me feeling dry and everything? He said, yes. He said, you wouldn't believe what actually happened. He said, when I went home, nothing initially changed. But after a few days of remaining faithful in prayer, I would open my Bible and pray and read the Word of God, he said, all of a sudden, one day, this new love for the Word of God just swept over my soul, and my spirit was refreshed and came alive again. When I heard that testimony, it encouraged me again about the Word of God and faith. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so there is a huge link between the Word of God and faith surging in our lives. Now, as we look at Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is a really um, a great book for many reasons. But, you know, there's been debate over who wrote it. But the, the fact is the inspired scriptures, all of the inspired scriptures has power to bring faith to your spirit and soul. And when the writer of Hebrews begin to pen those words. He was writing to um, Jewish believers who had gone through a lot of tribulation, a lot of persecution and trials, and some of them were actually turning back to Judaism. And as he's writing to them, he wants to inspire, he wants to encourage, but he's led by the Spirit of God. I just want to read from the New Living Translation, leading into chapter 11, these verses in chapter 10, verses 32 to 39. And in the New Living Translation, it says, Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned and, t and was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew that there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings to you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised for in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. If you know the old King James or King James Version, it says the just shall live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. This is the Lord speaking. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. The writer of Hebrews is writing to some people who are struggling in their faith and uh, struggling in, in, under persecution. Some have turned back. He's encouraging them to keep going. Then we begin in Hebrews and the first word of Hebrews 11, that as we begin to look at it, is the word now. That word now links the previous writings with what he's going to say. In the Greek, it means and, but, moreover, or now. Thus, linking them over. There is no chapter break in the original letter. It is just a flow on. So as he's talking to them about their, the, the future reward, as he's talking to them about having a confident trust in God, he now begins to define faith. I want to firstly talk to you about defining faith. My sermon's called Testimonies of Faith. But let's talk firstly about faith defined. So Hebrews 11.1 1 is a famous scripture that's quoted in many places. And this text of Hebrews 1 to 7 has been quoted, preached on 
spoken about many, many times. And as I began to study this particular portion of Scripture, I looked at it and I thought, what will God say to me today? Hebrews 11.1 1 in the New King James says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. New Living Translation says faith is the confidence that we, have, that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance that things about things we cannot see. New Revised Standard Version, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Vine's Bible Dictionary about this particular verse says, it's a firm conviction based on hearing Faith in God or Christ of things spiritual. How often have people struggled to define their faith when talking to an unbeliever or somebody that hasn't got a clue about the Scriptures? But faith is a confidence in God's divine purposes. Faith is a willingness to trust, to rely on or cling to. I cling to the God of His Word. My faith is in the God of His Word. Therefore, I have faith in His Word. Faith gives reality or substance to the things we're hoping for. Josie was mentioning this morning as she's reading that scripture about Jesus coming back. And we who believe in the second coming of Christ, who will not uh, uh, shrink back, are looking for a Christ that will come and redeem us and take us to be with Him. As with most spiritual issues, faith is not rational to those people who look from the outside. In worldly terms, they have no idea how we believe what we believe. But to me, faith is completely rational in the light of the Word. In the light of saints of old who have walked that path before me. Faith is never a profession that we can explain or understand everything that God does, everything that God is, or everything He's going to do. We don't profess to know all of that. But what faith is, is a confidence in Him about things we don't understand. New Century Version says of Hebrews 11, 1, faith means being sure of the things we hope for and knowing that something is real even if we don't see it. God's real even though I don't see Him. I've been moved. I've been shaken. I've been, re- I've been touched. I've, been, I've had an encounter. I know He's real. No one convinced me any, can convince me anything different. I know what I was like and then Christ redeemed me and saved me on March the 13th, 1983. Changed this sinful, uh, no good person who was bound in so many things and in a moment of time redeemed me and gave me hope and faith for the future. Faith brings the reality that life is more than what we see and feel. Yet today, it's all about what you see and feel. Even in churches sometimes. Make me feel good, Pastor. When I was evangelizing, everybody wanted the evangelist to put their hand on them. Come on, Pastor. Put, come on, evangelist. Put your hand on me. I want to shake. I want to rattle. I want to roll. <laughs> I want something, you know. Well, guess what? Faith doesn't come from me. <laughs> Faith doesn't come from the preacher. Faith in its... Real form is supernatural, it's from God, but it's, but it's God and us putting our trust in Him, even though we don't see Him. Faith is the confidence that we are more than just flesh and blood, that, but we are spirit and soul. Faith is more than just being positive. Faith acknowledges tragedy, hardship, pain. These Jewish believers were, had been persecuted. They'd lost their houses. They'd been thrown into jail. And the writer of Hebrews is encouraging them to keep believing God. Keep having faith. 
I have no idea where we're going as a society when the left is rising with such storm at the moment and the cancel culture and the various pressures that come upon us as Christians. I don't know where we're going. But what I do know is one thing's for sure, I am not going to let go of my Lord and Saviour, my God, my God's Word. A firm conviction that what I believe is true and I know it to be true. Matthew Henry said these words, faith is a firm persuasion and an expectation that God will perform all that he has promised to us in Christ. Faith proves to the mind the reality of things that cannot be seen with the bodily eye. For many of us, it's hard to put into words when we try to describe our faith. But I call it the knower. You just know that you know that you know that you know. I put my faith in God's word, but I put my faith in the God of his word. Secondly, I want to talk to you about faith testimonies. In the New King James Version, verse 2, it says, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By what? By faith. By faith they obtained a good testimony. In spite of the Holy Spirit, this writer now in an effort to continue to encourage these Christians who have been under persecution to keep going in Christ, now brings testimony of the saints of old. This has been called the faith chapter, the hallmark of faith, the heroes of faith chapter, all those various things. But in the short term, it is a short brief way, it is a testimony of faith. It is faith's testimony of the saints. As we look at these testimonies of men and women of the past who trusted, clung to, and even relied upon the Word of God, our faith is encouraged. When you read Hebrews 11, you cannot but be in admiration of these people who did not have the written Word necessarily, but had a word from God, and on the word of God, they put their faith, they put their trust that God's promises would come to pass. People just like us, really. But they had ears to hear. They trusted God who they served, and that became living faith. We have the benefit of their testimony. The gospel narratives in four gospels is Jesus' testimony while he walked the earth. But the Old Testament is the Old Testament testimonies of people who put their trust in God. It is the story of God's people, but it is also the story of people who... Uh, did not believe in God, who came into conflict with the people of God, the taking of the promised land, various other things. But in all of that, you, as you read their testimony, they weren't something. They weren't people that were somehow walked around with a halo over their head, or had, you know, they walked. All of them walked on water. No, they were people just like us. They were people just like us. For by it, faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. The truth is, for thousands of years, we've been reading about these people's testimonies and it's been inspiring people to live for God. When I heard that story of that man who was feeling dry and, 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 and struggling in his Christian faith, it encouraged me to hear that all he did was go again and be faithful to read and pray and call on God and faith was breathed into his spirit by the Holy Spirit. He began to be refreshed. Are you feeling dry today? Open your Bible. Begin to pray and say, Lord, what have you got to say to me today? Breathe freshness into my spirit. These people who we read of in the Scriptures, in, in the coming weeks as you read these testimonies, what you read of is people with spiritual backbone. 
They're not tossed around by every wind of doctrine or every feeling or how it feels today or how this is happening or what the governments or the leaders of that day were saying. They had spiritual backbone that characterized their understanding that life is more than the natural, it is supernatural and that there is a heavenly realm to gain. These people of faith were more concerned about the eternal than the earthly. I wonder how many of you are thinking about lunch right now. I've done it. I'm sorry. I've been in church and I lose, I lose concentration and I start thinking about a burger. <laughs> I start thinking about where can I take my wife for lunch. Don't do it right now. Michael. <laughs> So often we are, we're so hung up with the earthly. We get so stressed out about COVID, about finances, about family relationships, about all these different things that happen, work and the economy. And the, we are bombarded in the news and through the media about all the things of the world you've got to worry about. But these people had the spiritual fortitude, the, the spiritual backbone to say, no, we are pilgrims and sojourners, as it says in Hebrews 11, 13. This world is not our home. Stop worrying about it so much. You know, the threat to every Christian from now until Jesus' return is not persecution or death, financial ruin. You know what it is? It's a loss of faith. It's a loss of faith. Just like that man in my opening illustration, you could be at that place where you start to lose faith. You start to lose your zeal, your zest, your, your love for the Word of God and the things of God. Well, go back to the Word. Go back to the God of His Word and say, God, refresh me. Faith gives us the strength to believe God in spite of our difficult circumstances. That's what this book's about. These saints of old remain true to their convictions. I woke up yesterday morning. I take the preaching of the word very, very serious. So for the weeks leading up, I'll, I, I wake up and, and the sermon's on my mind or something else is on my mind. But I, I, my, my, my thoughts immediately yesterday is that these guys were soldiers of the faith. They were prepared to fight for what they believed in. And I'm not talking about taking physical arms. I'm saying that they spiritually woke up every day and put their trust and their faith in God and refused to give in on their convictions. These people had a direction and a goal. They led others into faith and trust in God. And they were soldiers of the faith, willing to endure hardship and cling to their faith and their faith in the Lord, living, uh, the, the Lord God. 2 Timothy 2.3 in the New King James Version says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Most of us don't like that scripture because it's got a word in there we don't like. Well, two really, endure and hardship. I thought it'd be really easy serving God. Buckle up. Put your spiritual helmet on and get ready for the ride of your life. Because I don't think it's going to get that much easier for Christians. The testimonies of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, as we'll see in the weeks to come, most of their lives wasn't easy. But they, they possessed a faith that endured. By faith in God, believers embrace this hardship and say, God, with your help, I can make it through. As we move on to verse 3, we see that believers embrace the creation of the world. I love it at work in the mornings. I get to work probably 7 o'clock and some of these guys who are unbelievers like to take me on. So one of them says, when are you coming to our church? It's the casino. 
I said, never. They said, oh, you go, at least we get 50-50 on our money. You just go and give all your money to the church. I said, 50-50, are you kidding? Are you telling me you, you got a 50-50 chance in a casino? I mocked them mercilessly. <laughs> I said, and then they started to amp it up a bit, and I, I have to confess, I got a bit, bit heated. I said, take the churches out of society. Stop giving the churches and see how much charity you got around the place. Thank God for the salvos. It's a wonder, salvos do a wonderful job. But take those Bible-believing people out of society and what do you got? A poorer society. Anyway, these, one of the other guys is a scientist. He, and he wants to take me on about creation. So I say, in the beginning, God. And he says, what? I said, in the beginning, God. There's nothing more to say. <laughs> you weren't there. <laughs> when did a rock become alive? Oh, well, yeah. No, you can't explain that to me. You've got no answer. In verse 3, it says, By faith we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things were, which are seen were made of things which are invisible. That's faith. And the saints of old, the elders of old, as we are seeing their testimony, they believe that. I believe it. Psalms 33, 6, By the word of, of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalms 33, 9, For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood still. By faith we embrace and we should defend the God of creation. Michael Guzzi, an online commentator, said, We do not see the act of creation. We only know it by faith. We also know that this, this by reason, because we know the worlds were made by an intelligent designer. This is faith going beyond, but not in contradiction to reason. It's one of the greatest comforts to the human spirit to believe that we're not here by random chance and accident, but we are created in the image of our God. It brings great comfort to me I'm not an accident. We had three surprises called children. My father said, don't you know how this happens? They're not accidents, they were just surprises. They're made in the image of God. By faith I accept and I am fully convinced that God spoke and the world came into being. How do you feel about that? The testimony of the saints of old, not only did they accept it, but they defended it. Moving on to verse 4. The writer of Hebrews now starts to deal with individuals in a testimony. In verse 4 it says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it being dead still speaks. In the previous text in Romans, uh, in Hebrews 10, it says the just shall live by faith. We understand that Abraham was made righteous by faith. Faith. Therefore, Enoch's, uh, sorry, Abel's faith was the uh, was more excellent in the eyes of God than Cain's. Cain didn't come by faith. Abel came by faith. You can talk about quality or quantity of his offering, but isn't the issue faith? Abel gave a faith offering to the Lord of the very best of his flocks. The difference between the offerings of Cain and Abel, can you can try and quantify it, but I say it was the issue of faith. It was the issue and the context of faith that pleases God. That's why in Hebrews 11, 6, he says, but without faith is impossible to please him. The next testimony is the testimony of Enoch. 
By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch lived in the midst of a generation that was not righteous. In Genesis chapter 5, you can read that story. But it says that Enoch walked with the Lord all his life 365 years. How many people know that's a long walk? And you and I complain because we don't see the promises of God in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year. But he walked 365 years with the Lord, faithfully believing him. I think the problem with our faith sometimes is that we don't realize that it's the long distance faith that matters, not short term, quick belief. In the margin of my Bible, some years ago, I wrote, Faith refuses the easy, sinful path. When reading Hebrews, the Lord spoke to me and said, Faith refuses the easy, sinful path. Faith isn't a spiritual football that once you kick it through the goals, you get the prize. Faith is is a long-term issue. It's a long-term thing that you and I, as we put our faith in God, He promises to reward. I want to talk to you about faith's reward. Thirdly and finally. Hebrews 11.6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I'm telling you, you could preach a whole sermon just on that one verse. In fact, I've heard plenty on that one verse. But what I want to point out to you today is that he's a rewarder. I don't know how you see God sometimes. I've met Christians who almost have an, a picture of God that he walked, that he's waiting to punish us whenever we step outside the, the, the rules, the regulations. It's like he's sitting up there with a lump of 4B2 waiting for you to put your toe over the line and smack it, you know. God's not like that to me. To me, he's a rewarder. He's a rewarder as I have sought him and prayed and believed in him. I haven't done anything sometimes and God just rewards me. I am confident that if I was to die right now, I'd go home to heaven to be with the Lord. Wherever he is, I'll go to be with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's a reward. I walk in confidence. I read a, I read a quote the other day and I heard um, Pastor Bill Cathy confirmed that he heard it probably 30 or 40 years ago. It says, God's man in the middle of God's will is immortal until God is finished with him. I thought, whoa, I can, I can, I can walk on that one for a while. That's a rock you can stand on. Any person in God's will, putting their faith in Him is pleasing Him, yes, but you are immortal until God's done with you. That day is my, the days of man are numbered by Him, God, not by us. I can take as many vitamins as I can, but it ain't going to change what God's will is. And I do take vitamins, by the way, because I'm not a big fruit eater. <laughs> Yeah, I need to eat my veggies. Thank you, Pete. Hebrews 10.35 says, do not, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence or your faith, which has great reward. Hebrews 11.26, Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Firstly, let, let me talk to you about earthly reward. Time doesn't allow me to testify, but of the many 
many healings that I have seen. And there are other people here today that have been on mission trips, been in different church services. You've seen miracles. I've seen legs grow out. I've seen blind eyes heal. One guy in Papua New Guinea had been hit with a rock 30 years earlier, came into the building, couldn't see, got prayed for. I've got it on video. He walks out. He's got a flower in his, in his hand and he's smiling as he's looking at God's creation, a flower, because it was the first time in 30 years he'd seen. Time doesn't permit for the earthly rewards that we see. But we were talking this morning before service. You know, I have the peace of God in my heart. That's a reward i got the joy, 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 joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Down in my heart. I've got it. No one can take it. It's there. It's a reward from the Lord. I ain't going to sing like Pastor Bob, you know. <laughs> you know, believers cry out. They come to service and they cry out in faith to God about relationships and various finances and miracle healings and deliverance and, and habits that need. I've seen God do it all. And that's His reward now. And sometimes those rewards are in the midst of great setbacks and trials and struggles. They're unexpected. Can I testify just for a few minutes? I'm going to go over time, but I need to testify. Two weeks ago, I was in, uh, uh, um, sorry, about 10 days ago, I was in coffee with somebody having coffee, and he's an ophthalmologist or works in an ophthalmology, that's eyes. And I was saying to him, I'm having a bit of trouble with my eye. I've had a few injuries over the years. When I was boxing, I got a poke in the eye and um, broke my uh, socket, the eye socket. I had a piece of grass get in my eye about four weeks ago. I was unable to come to church. I was up all night. They had to remove it out of my eye. Anyway, I... I, I went to, he said, you need to go to an optometrist first or a doctor and get a referral to go to a specialist. So on Monday, I went to an optometrist. They put me through various tests and all of a sudden, I started to sense in this guy's voice, he was worried. He said, I'm going to give you a referral to a specialist. I want you to go as soon as possible. Straight after this, after, after here, I'm going to email, uh, after you leave, I'll email him and I'll ask him to put, him in, put you in as soon as possible. I rang an hour later, this was Tuesday, uh, on Monday, Tuesday they said, yeah, come in at 12 o'clock. I get there at 12 o'clock, um, uh, I go through some preliminary examinations with, with his assistant, there's about 10, 15 people in the room and they're all got 12, 10 appointments and I'm thinking, what's going on here? Anyway, they were post-op people and so uh, he brings me in ahead of those people, he examines my eye. And he says, if you didn't come in uh, uh, today, he said, uh, in a couple of weeks, you would have been blind in your right eye. I said to him, okay, can we, what can we do? He says, it's okay, I can fix it today. I said, cool. He said, you just have to wait in the, in the waiting room and I've got to deal with all these people. They're only short appointments. So I waited about half an hour, I sat outside. The waiting room was just full. He just churned through them. He said, come in, I've got time for you right now. And he was really, really, this guy was really, really nice. He's an Indian guy, Dr. Raja. He's really, just a really nice guy. So he starts working on me and um, he does this laser thing where and he basically it spot welds your retina back together again. And, um, and it felt like there was something going through to the back of your head. It wasn't real nice. Anyway, he says, oh, we've moved into this office and I haven't got the, the right equipment to do. You've got two tears, he said. One's really large and one's small. He said, I can do one, but the other one I haven't got the equipment to do here. I, he said, what do you got planned for the rest of the day? I said, nothing. He said, well, he said, I'm the head of ophthalmology at um, Joondalup Hospital and also Charlie Gardner's and I've got to go to Charlie Gardner's straight after this. Would you mind if I drive you down to Charlie Gardner's? He's the head of departments and he's offering to drive me down there. Okay. I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right? He's, so he says, just got to wait about 15 minutes. So he puts me in the car. We're getting his Audi. And <laughs> 
uh, he, he looks, uh, I look in the back and he's got a child seat, so I engage him in conversation. I've oh, got kids. How long have you been doing eyes? All that sort of stuff. He starts telling me. He tells me about his wife, how she's a Hindu and how she goes to temple all the time. And I said, all right. And so I start testifying to him about my son. And he said, what's your son's business name? I said, all safe, WA. He said, they came out to my house two weeks ago and helped me with my house. I said, okay. And he said, I said, his business has only just taken a real turn. It's going really, really well. I said, and then I started to testify about my son's faith in Christ. And then I said, we're all Christians in my family. And he said, oh, that's good. He said, um, he said, and then I said, I had a real conversion to Christ when I was 22. He said, tell me about it. That's an open door to an evangelist, isn't it? <laughs> Feet and all, let's get into this. And I started testifying to him about the love of God and what Jesus had done for me and how my son, when he was only three years old, put his hand on my head and I got healed of a headache. So my son, because my son said, Dad, read me a book. I said, no, I don't want to. He said, oh, what is, uh, why not? And he said, you got a headache? And I said, well, um, well I, 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 yeah, I've got a headache. And he said, well, ask Jesus to heal it. Three-year-old. I said, I don't want to. I was laying on the lounge. I didn't really, really want to read the book. He, and I said, why don't you ask? So he put his hand on my head, prayed for me, and the headache went, and I read the book. This, this, this doctor is just bug-eyed at me. He's listening to every word. By the time we get into the car park, he says, you know what? I believe God brought you to my clinic and that God caused me to drive you all the way down here to Charlie Gardner's. So he marches me in. There's 40 people in this clinic. He marches me past the 40 people into his, into his group, uh, he, into his doctors. That, it was a bit more painful. This one I don't want to describe you to. It was, it was full on. I had this gizmo on my eye and everything. Anyway, the upshot was it got done. I believe that was God, because I choose to believe in Him, He gives me unexpected rewards at different times that you don't know about sometimes. You can call it the favour of God, I call it the reward of God. Not because of anything I do, but because I believe Him. It's grace. I need to finish. We may... We may we may see some reward in our, for our faith here on earth, but guess what? The greatest reward is in eternity. It's the heavenly reward that we should be focused on. Not the rewards here today. Bless God when they come, but guess what? You need to be looking to the Lord forever. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, then we will be with the Lord forever. So comfort one another with these words. We're going to be with the Lord forever. The heavenly reward is coming. Have faith in God and endure all hardship because it only is for a season and then it's for eternity we live for Him, with Him in here forever. I'm going to close. I've got to close. Because when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? Will He find you in faith? Make that determination today. Make it every day. I like that song. When I wake up in the morning, I'm going to trust Him. Grace. Believe in God. Have faith in God. You know, Noah's reward was that he, for 120 years, he built an ark. And he would have copped a bit of hard time. They had never seen rain. They, nothing like a flood before. How do you mean it's going to flood? 120 years he endured. What, what, what was his reward? Not only was it eternity, but he saved. He saw his family saved. I read a story. I'm going to close with this. Maybe the musicians can come right now. I read a, uh, read a story about an old missionary couple that were, had gone to Africa and, and been there many, many years. They had come to that place in their life where there was no more support. They had really hadn't seen too much happen in Africa, so they decided to head home. So they got on a boat. They didn't know that Teddy Roosevelt, 
the US United States president at that time it was also on that boat. There was a lot of fanfare. Everybody wanted to talk to him, see him, everything else like that. The missionary couple were just silently off in the corner. When they arrived at New York, there was bands playing. There was the mayor. There was uh, the governor of the state was there. And they're all there to say hi, Teddy. And Teddy had just gone on a hunting trip. And he was returning home. The old missionary said to his wife, he said, it's just not fair. There's no one to meet us here. I feel like we're a failure. We didn't do that much. We've got no money. I don't know what's happening in the future. And this guy, everybody wants to touch him. They're all happy he's home. They left the boat. Went and found a cheap place to stay. But it was eaten away at the old missionary. God's never let him down yet. What you were saying earlier. But he felt like he was let down. He decided to have a whinge to his wife and his godly wife. Said to him, why don't you go and talk to the Lord about it? So he went in the room and began to lay out his complaint to God. And when he had finished, he felt that still, quiet voice of God. Because he complained that no one was there to welcome them when they came home. No one, no one paid them any attention. And the still voice of God said, but you're not home yet. We're not home yet. We're still on a journey, aren't we? Some of us are a little closer than others, Pastor Bob, <laughs> to getting home. Oh, you're going to say Margaret. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> but we're not home yet. We're still on this faith journey. Let's not shrink back. Let's not hold back. Let's just live with faith in our hearts, invigorated by what God has done in the past and what God is going to do now and what God will do in the future in your life. Live for Him with all your heart, your mind, your soul and strength. And if you're dry and you feel like the Word of God is just, it's just hard, open your Bible and pray. And believe in the God of His Word to refresh you in faith so that you can go on and serve the Lord and one day hear those wonderful words, the reward for our faith, which is, well done, good and faithful servant. We hope and pray that you were blessed by that message today. If you have any questions or prayer requests, please feel free to contact us by the email below. 